Why is God called holy three times in Isaiah 6? And why does the Holy Spirit have holy in his name instead of loving or powerful? We're going to try to answer these questions and continue searching out a more biblical way of understanding the Hebrew word kadash, which is where our word holy in English comes from. Once again, we're going to see that the core meaning of holiness has nothing to do with separation, but rather of meeting, belonging, and total devotion. I'm Andrew Case. This is Working for the Word. Here we go. excited about this episode. There's so much to learn about this topic, and I hope you're finding it to be rewarding. There's something so wonderful about meditating on such a beautiful quality or aspect of God's character. So we're going to keep going with this as long as we can. Once again, I just want to reiterate, this is a conversation starter. It's not the end of the conversation on holiness. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. There's dissertations that need to be written on this topic. And basically, there's a whole book that needs to be written that exhaustively covers every occurrence of the root Kadash in Hebrew and discusses everything at length. And that would be an extremely huge project to take on, but a worthy one. So anyone out there hearing this, Maybe God's calling you to do that and to give away that book for free, all right? Put it in Creative Commons, open access license, get it out there on the internet, and bless some people. Anyway, I want to start out by reading the passage on the burning bush in Exodus 3. This is a really important passage for our understanding of holiness because it's the first significant use of the word in the Hebrew Bible, So we're going to look at this, and then I want to read to you some of the comments that Costa Calda, in his dissertation, writes about his understanding of how holy is being used here. So let's start. Exodus 3.1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So the main verse that we want to look at here is verse 5. So God says, do not come near. So first command. Second command, take your sandals off your feet. And then he gives the ground clause for that. All right. The reason for taking sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So, Two commands, do not come near, and then take your sandals off your feet. Now, right here, I think, is one of those obvious places where you can understand how we got to where we are today with so many people assuming that holiness refers to purity or something that is taboo or distance or separateness, right? Because we assume that God says, do not come near because of his holiness. And so there's this idea of, well, we can't approach God. We're separate from God. There's a distance between us and God. We're cut off from intimacy with God because of our impurity. And he is 
absolutely pure, and so those things can't mix. And so holiness is all about God's purity. And then we assume also that the reason we're taking off the sandals, or Moses is taking off the sandals, is because the ground is clean, is because it's in God's presence. Now it's been purified by his purity. And so we naturally assume because of our cultural blinders, that this idea of taking off your sandals is to start walking in a a pure place. You usually don't want to leave your dirty shoes on when you're about to step into a really pristine, clean place, right? So lots of cultures have this as just a typical everyday custom. When you go into the house, you always take off your shoes, For all my Canadian friends out there, you know what I'm talking about. This is part of your culture for a lot of you. And then if you've ever been to a mosque, for example, I was visiting Israel and there was a certain place where they think Abraham was buried and it's a biggest disappointment of your life if you go there. But you you go into a mosque and you have to take off your shoes to enter the mosque. And there's all these, you know, nice carpets around and stuff. And then the biggest disappointment was going to this supposed place that the mosque is built over. You can look down a little tiny hole in the ground and it supposedly goes down into this cave. And then you see like three candles burning down there in the distance, in the darkness. And that's, that's Abraham's tomb, supposedly. So, absolute total joke. You'd do much better to just sit and look at a tree in Palestine. It'd be much more edifying than doing that. So anyway, neither here nor there. We're here to talk about holy. So back to Costa Calda. So what does he say about this passage? He says, a generally accepted reason is this, the sanctity of the place is a barrier that prevents Moses and later the people from approaching the mountain or the bush or whatever. So the mountain is taboo, a forbidden place. The presence of God on the mountain makes this place inaccessible and causes Moses to be afraid. So that's the typical explanation he's saying. Now he continues, this explanation does not take into account all the data in the text. God does not forbid Moses to approach the holy ground but the burning bush. The holy ground includes the precise place where Moses stands and not only the bush where Yahweh speaks, since he orders Moses two distinct things. Okay? Do not come near and take off your sandals. The holy ground is therefore wider than the place where Yahweh speaks. So this is important. Let me stop there. That's a really important distinction. Yahweh is speaking in this place that is unapproachable, the burning bush. The holy ground is where Moses is already standing. So he continues, It follows that the prohibition of approaching does not relate to the holy ground. Okay, that's not not set apart or prohibited. Then he continues, the holy place is not a place of fear or taboo. The holy place therefore includes not only the bush, but the whole mountain called the mountain of God. Moses stands on a holy place. He does not just approach it. So he's already standing on it. The mountain is not taboo and it does not inspire fear any more than the bush does. The bush actually causes curiosity. The fear that seizes Moses in the story does not come from the character of the mountain. It is provoked by the shock of the vision of God. This unexpected meeting with God seized him with dread. So basically he's saying the fear is inspired in Moses because he's seeing God It's the presence of God that causes fear. Now, the holiness of the place is not the source of the fear. That's the key distinction. 
So he continues, it is therefore improperly that we speak of holy fear, at least in terms of biblical vocabulary. The mountain is called Kodesh because of the presence of God on it, and not because of a quote-unquote sacredness in character proper to the place on which Moses stands. The mountain is dedicated to the divinity. Thus, in Exodus 3, we find a sense of a derivative of the root Kadash, current in the 12th century before Jesus Christ, where the holy ground is not the place of separation or radical distance, but of encounter and the presence, the encounter of God and man. End quote. So now, what do we do with this whole thing of taking off the sandals? What is that communicating? What does God mean by that command? And so, Costa writes, God could have asked Moses to perform a ritual act already known at the time of Moses, to recognize that the place is owned by God. Moses did not know that God was present on the mountain. He did not know that it was Kadosh. As soon as he learns it, he must remove his sandals. To climb on the mountain of God demands a respectful attitude. This gesture reveals the fact that the owner of the soil is God and not man. End quote. So what he's explaining is that this is an ancient Near Eastern ritual. It's a way of showing respectfully that you are not the owner. It is an act of depossession. You can see this also in the book of Ruth, when the Goel, the Redeemer, removes his sandal to communicate this in front of the elders of the city. By removing his sandal, he's saying, I relinquish my ownership of the right to be the Goel, the Redeemer. So in the context of Moses here, this is simply an act of saying, this ground belongs to God. God owns it. It is totally devoted to him. And so it's in these kinds of places where heaven and earth intersect, where God comes down in a special way, that we find places of meeting with God. So a holy place is a place where you meet with God. It's not a place where you feel separate from God. On the contrary, it's a place where you draw near to God and where he draws near to man. Now, if you're like me, I'm slow, and it takes me time to wrap my mind around these sorts of things, especially a paradigm shift in the way I've grown up and heard something used thousands upon thousands of times. So let's do this. Let's hear Dr. Peter Gentry's faculty address where he unpacks some of these things in very similar ways, because he's also riffing off of Costa Calda, but... He's been thinking about these things a lot longer than I have. And then let's also hear what he has to say. And this is an excellent, excellent exposition of Isaiah 6. Why is God referred to as holy three times? And what is going on with the seraphim and all of those things in that scene? So you're about to hear the best explanation I've ever heard of that passage. This is a faculty address at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. It's freely available on the internet, but I want to highlight it here, at least parts of it, because I think it's just one of those things that got buried in the internet, and there's so many people who have never heard of it and never experienced it, and they would never find it otherwise. So let's go ahead and listen to Dr. Peter Gentry. No one holy like Yahweh is Hannah's bold praise when God granted her request for a child. Hannah's praise is based not only on her own experience, but also on the revelation given at the Exodus. Moses' song at the sea rang out, Who is like you among the gods, Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? As we shall see, the revelation of God as holy 
and the creation of a people who are holy are connected specifically with the event of the Exodus. Saint is, in fact, an Exodus word. And indeed, Paul's use in the New Testament is in view of the work of Jesus Christ in bringing about a new Exodus. Unfortunately, the Church of Jesus Christ, at least in the Western world, has not understood very well the meaning of the word holy, nor what it means to worship a holy God. Noteworthy is the passage in Exodus 3 where Moses encounters Yahweh in the burning bush and is asked to remove his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. This is the first instance in the Old Testament of the root kadash in either an adjectival or noun form. Indeed, only one instance of the related verb is found prior to this text, Genesis 2, verse 3. So Exodus 3 is foundational to our thinking about the word. As Costa Calda observes, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not called by them a holy God, nor was he worshipped by them at a holy place. God waited until he called Moses and revealed himself to him to announce to the shepherd that the mountain of God is a holy place, Azmath Kodesh, normally translated holy ground. Why does God designate the mountain as a Kodesh place? One reason generally given is as follows. The holiness of the place is a barrier which prevented Moses and later the people from approaching. The mountain is taboo or a forbidden place. The presence of God as the totally other upon the mountain makes the place inaccessible and provokes fear in Moses because of the holy character of the mountain. Muhlenberg, for example, in the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, expresses this view. He states, The consciousness of the radical cleavage between the human and the divine is rooted in taboo and is illustrated in the law of the harem, in which man is forbidden to appropriate what belongs to God and in the frequent prohibitions against profanation. The holy is unapproachable. Man must not come near to it. Thus Moses must not come near, for the place on which he stands is Kodesh. This explanation does not account for all the facts given in the text. God does not forbid Moses from approaching the holy ground, but only from coming near the bush, the place from which he speaks. The ground designated as holy includes the precise place where Moses stands, not just the bush where Yahweh speaks. In the narrative of Exodus 3, Moses is given two distinct and separate commands, one don't come near here. And two, remove your sandals because the place where you are standing is holy ground. The holy ground then is much larger than the bush where Yahweh speaks. It follows that the command which forbids him to approach does not apply to the ground declared holy, but only to the precise spot where Yahweh speaks. The causal clause informing Moses that he is standing on holy ground is the reason for removing his sandals and is not connected to the command to stay away from the bush. The holy ground, then, encompasses a larger space than just the bush from which God speaks, and is, in fact, equivalent to the area designated as the mountain of God in verse 1. Moses is standing on a Kodesh place. There is nothing inaccessible or restricted about approaching there. The mountain of God is not taboo or a forbidden place. Moreover, it does not inspire fear any more than the bush, which rather provokes curiosity. The fear which seizes Moses in the narrative does not spring from the sacrosanct character of the mountain. It is provoked by the shock of the vision of God. This unexpected meeting with God seizes him with fright. Verse 6 shows clearly the difference between fear and holy, because the fear is not inspired by the holy mountain, but only by the vision of God. It is therefore improper to speak of holy fear if our language is to be genuinely true to Scripture. As already noted, holy ground appears as a synonym of the mountain of God. From the culture of that time, there is nothing astonishing about this, because we know already in the 14th century before Christ at Ugarit that Baal dwells on a mountain, and that the mountain of Baal is also called a Kodesh place in the Ugaritic literature. By contrast, however, the mountain in Exodus 3, verse 1, is called Kodesh 
because of the presence of God upon it and not because of a holy character inherent or proper to the place where Moses stands. In the course of Moses' vision, it is not so much the place as such which is valued, but the presence of God upon it. This is when it becomes remarkable. The mountain is Kodesh because it is the mountain of God. We can recognize then in Exodus 3 a meaning of a derivative of the root Kadash, current in the 14th century before Jesus Christ, where the Kodesh ground is not the place of distance or radical separation, but of meeting and of presence. The meeting of God and man. In standing on the ground which belongs to God, Moses is not called Kadosh, but to be allowed to walk there, he must submit to the practice of a rite or ritual, remove his sandals. Is this an innovation? Undoubtedly not. The act of removing one's sandals, like the act of the nearest relative in Deuteronomy 25 or Ruth 4, is a ceremony or rite of depossession, well known in the culture of that time. The goel must remove his sandal to show his relinquishing of the rights of purchase. Moses must acknowledge that this ground belongs to God and enter into an attitude of consecration. Thus, rather than marking an item as set apart, holy ground is ground consecrated, devoted, or prepared for the meeting of God and man. In speaking from the middle of the bush, God manifests his desire to be present in the midst of men. But he presents himself progressively, first of all to Moses, who would not dare to look at him, and who is surprised at the time and seized with fear. It is God in the text who takes the initiative in meeting men. He is the one who declares the mountain to be Kodesh ground. It is not man who decides to meet the God of the patriarchs. It is not he who consecrates this invisible God to this invisible God a particular place. The narrator insists on the divine initiative. It seems that the most suitable translation of Kodesh in Exodus 3 must be something like consecrated or devoted ground. God has chosen the place of the meeting. He waits for Moses, and and after having prepared the ground, he presents himself to the shepherd and makes him a part of his project of salvation. We turn now to Isaiah 6 to address the question arising naturally in our minds, if holy means essentially consecrated or devoted, what then does it mean to apply this adjective to God? How is he consecrated or devoted? Certain aspects of this text depict God as awesome and transcendent. Isaiah begins by telling us that he saw the Lord, Adonai, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. God is exalted, He is the high king. We are told that the edges of his robe filled the temple. This is not only an expression of the awesome greatness of God, but clearly indicates that Isaiah was prostrate on the ground. This is why he could only see the hem of his robe. The vision of God, this vision of God is similar to the theophany granted to the nobles of Israel when the covenant with Israel was ratified on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. There, too, they saw the God of Israel. But all that they report seeing are the bright blue lapis lazuli bricks under his feet. They, too, were flat out on the ground, and they were so awestruck that their eyes were raised no higher than the paving stones under God's feet. We are further told in verse 3 that the glory of the Lord fills the earth. When the tabernacle was built in Exodus 40, a bright cloud designated as the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Likewise, when Solomon built and dedicated the temple in 1 Kings 8, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Here in Isaiah's vision, the glory of the Lord fills the earth. This indicates that the entire earth is his sanctuary or temple and that he rules the whole world. Later on, I will discuss the seraphim, but I can already say at the start that whatever they are, the word means burning ones. They are beings of fire. In addition, the foundations of the doorpost shake and the place is filled with smoke. Earthquake, fire, and smoke clearly speak of the God of Sinai. In Abram's vision in Genesis 15, God reveals himself as a smoking fire pot and blazing torch. In Exodus 3, which is a foretaste 
and precursor to Sinai, he reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. According to Exodus 19, when God came on Mount Sinai, accompanied by earthquake, fire, and smoke, was how he showed himself. He appeared similarly to Ezekiel in chapter 1 in clouds and fire. In Daniel 7, his throne was flaming with fire and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. There is no question that the Lord whom Isaiah sees is the God who made the covenant with Israel at Sinai. God is holy. The concept that God is holy is not new. This idea is found before Isaiah's time. Nonetheless, Isaiah's favorite term for God is the Holy One of Israel, or Jacob. He uses this term some 26 times, while outside the book of Isaiah it is found only six times. The vision of God given to Isaiah at the beginning of his life and ministry as a prophet profoundly affected his life and radically shaped his message and ministry. Thus, the vision of Yahweh as a holy God is not new. What is new is the particular message which God gives to Isaiah in verses 8 to 13. In the text of Isaiah 6, it is when God appears to the prophet that Isaiah hears the voice of the seraphim proclaiming the holiness of the Lord. This declaration accompanies the coming of God among men in the temple and attests his presence in the place of consecration. God appears in the place which belongs to him, the sanctuary, but he does not stay in the Holy of Holies, the place that is most consecrated. Instead, he lets himself be seen by men in the front room of the temple, the great hall. This is clearly evident from two or three facts in the text. The Hebrew word used here is heikal. In 1 Kings 6 through 8, the passage describing the construction of the temple, the word bayath or house is used for the temple as a whole, which is divided into two rooms. The first, the front room or great hall is called the heikal, and elsewhere the holy place. The back room is called the devir or holy of holies. In Isaiah 6, the Lord is not in the Devere, the Holy of Holies. He is in the Hake Hall, the front room, the great hall of his palace. Note that the standard term for the temple as a whole, bieth or house, is used in verse 4 and clearly contrasts with Hake Hall in verse 1. Secondly, Isaiah says that the bases of the doorpost shook. This makes it absolutely clear that the Lord is in the front room because Isaiah is at the doorway and would not have been able to see into the back room from the doorway. So while God is awesome in his majesty, his holiness does not mean that he is the totally totally other, nor does it speak of his separation. In fact, we see just the opposite here. We see that God is coming to meet man. We see already the central theme of this new section of Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. The role of the seraphim. Thirdly, Isaiah sees the seraphim in his vision. It is important to note what he does not see as much as what he does see. He sees the seraphim and not the cherubim. Normally, images of the cherubim guarded access to the presence of God in the garden and the temple. Their wings protected the mercy seat of the ark, and they were on the curtains guarding the holy of holies. What, we may ask, is intended by the fact that Isaiah sees seraphim instead of cherubim. The word seraph is actually quite rare, and it's it's not not an English word, it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word, saraph. The same word occurs in Numbers 21, verses 6 to 8, and refers to the fiery snakes or serpents which struck the Israelites. It also refers to a fiery snake in Deuteronomy 8, verse 15, Number, Isaiah 14, 29, and 30, verse 6. In the instances in Isaiah 14 and 30, the seraphim are specifically designated as winged serpents, which clearly connects them to the instances in chapter 6. It is interesting that we have annals from King Azar Haddon of Assyria describing his journey across the desert to Egypt and exactly the same spot where Israel encountered the fiery snakes He mentions strange creatures with batting wings. Finally, we have two occurrences in Isaiah 6 for a total of seven instances in the Hebrew Bible. Probably the word was transliterated instead of translated because the translators did not see 
how the seraphim here could be connected to the other occurrences where the word refers to snakes. We have pictures of winged snakes from both Egypt and Syria, and they have feet, hands, and faces. So just because they have feet, hands, and faces does not mean that they cannot be snakes. According to Isaiah 14, verse 29, a winged seraph is a symbol of a future Hebrew king. And in your handout, you can see Hebrew seals, some of them royal with winged snakes on them. If you think that my interpretation is far-fetched, recall 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, a passage which describes King Hezekiah's efforts to rid the temple of idols and idolatrous objects. One item mentioned is the bronze snake, the seraph made by Moses, which by this time had become an object of idolatrous worship, and the Israelites burned incense to it. Since Hezekiah became king in 715, this bronze snake was actually in the temple at the time of King Uzziah's death in 740 when Isaiah was given this vision. The seraphim form, I think, an intertextual link to Numbers 21. Their purpose and role in the vision is to remind Isaiah and us of the journey out of Egypt to the promised land when they complained in the desert about God's great provisions in in food and water. By complaining about his provision for them, the people were in reality saying that God was not completely, completely devoted, and so they impugned his holiness. The people of Isaiah's time were promoting a society full of social injustice and saying that God should hurry up and bring the day of judgment that he promised. In this way, they were saying he was not devoted to his justice and so impugned his holiness. Such a meaning is entirely consonant with uses of the word connected to the journey through the desert. Numbers 20 is an example where Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. The verb occurs in the Hiphiel and in the Niphal stem, adequately rendered in the NIV. Moses and Aaron's act of disobedience did not treat Yahweh as holy, that is, as completely devoted to the job of bringing the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. He was not behind the project 100%. That's what they were saying. Even so, the actions of Yahweh did demonstrate precisely the fact that he was fully consecrated and devoted to his promise and task. Another example similar to this is Isaiah 63, verse 10, where we read that during the journey through the wilderness, the people of Israel grieved God's Holy Spirit. The term spirit speaks of someone as they are empowered, and in this context, it is the messenger of his presence that mediates God's care for the people in providing protection from cold and heat through the cloud and also food and water. Yet the people constantly questioned that God was devoted to his promise to bring them through and complained about his care and provisions for them. In the vision of Isaiah, the seraphim cover themselves as a sign of respect and submission, and Isaiah is conscious of his impurity. He is not ready to meet God. He is a man of unclean lips and dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He ought not to see the king, the Lord of armies. Notice that the fear which inspires Isaiah is not a fear of holiness. He does not say, mine eyes have seen the Holy One, but rather, mine eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of armies. As in Exodus 3, it is not the holiness of God which inspires fear, but the vision of God himself. In seeing God, the prophet dreads to be crushed by the majesty of the sovereign king, and once purified, he does not hesitate to meet God in verse 8. The fact that the word holy is repeated three times is not related to the New Testament doctrine of the Trinity. It is only a form of extreme emphasis in the Hebrew language, and it's found four times in the Hebrew Bible. Now, this is only a little part of the whole address, so please go listen to the whole thing. It'll be linked in the description. There's a lot more exposition that follows that's really important. But what I do want to do is listen to what he comments about the New Testament to lead us into a further discussion of the Holy Spirit. So let's listen to that. 
This is only the beginnings of a fresh study of the word holy in the Old Testament. Interestingly, if one begins to analyze the counterpart in Greek, the word hagios, the basic meaning given in Little and Scott is also devoted. New Testament scholars should pay closer attention to this. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology states that God's holiness means that he is separated from sin and devoted to seeking his own honor. Further reading yields a discussion that is traditional so that the use of the word devoted in his opening sentence is confused with the notion of separation. Indeed, the systematic theologians of the last 500 years have not been helpful in re- explaining what scripture teaches on this topic due to reliance on doubtful etymologies and connection of the term with moral purity and transcendence. As we have seen, purity is the result of being holy in the biblical sense, but it is not the essence of the word. Nor is the word connected with the divine transcendence, however much this idea is otherwise made plain in Scripture. The basic meaning of the word is consecrated or devoted. In Scripture, it operates within the context of covenant relationships and expresses commitment. One day in the barnyard, the hen and the pig were discussing the difference in meaning between the words involvement and commitment. The pig told the hen, when the farmer comes from breakfast tomorrow, you're only involved, but I'm committed. (laughs) The cross is a revelation of the divine holiness. This short study should not only illuminate clearly and simply the meaning of holy and what it means for God to be holy, but also to provide a warning that every generation needs to test theological traditions by means of fresh study of the Bible in the original texts. We cannot simply rely on our systematic theologies for an understanding of Christian teaching. Luke commended believers in Berea as more noble than those in Thessalonica because they daily examined the scriptures to see if what they were taught was true. Around 600, a Scotch-Irish mission led by Columbanus appeared in the Frankish kingdom. For the first time, the Franks became acquainted with a Christianity which made extraordinarily high demands, not on others, but rather on itself. They saw clerics who were godly shepherds, whose learning surpassed anything found in the Frankish kingdom. Kurt Allen says, We hear about a conflict between the Scotch-Irish Columbanus and a papal legate who confronted him with the old tradition of the continental church, to which Columbanus retorted, The truth which drives out error is older than every tradition. We are in a unique position today to make advances in our grasp and understanding of the scriptures. Historically, Christian theology was developed almost entirely from the Latin or Greek versions of the Bible for the first 1,500 years. Although the Reformers stressed the importance of studying the original texts, we have been more eager sometimes to study their works than to heed their cry ad fontes. The last 300 years have been marred by a scholarship which imposes modern Western ideas of literary analysis on ancient Eastern texts. At the same time, huge advances have been made in the last 150 years in the knowledge of the cultural backdrop of the text and its linguistic data. In the last 40 years, literary structures, especially in the Old Testament, have been elucidated. Also, after 200 years, there is also a new willingness to construct a meta-narrative based on scripture itself and not simply upon systems which owe more to modern philosophy than the Bible for their larger story. Unfortunately, when biblical studies went awry, Systematic theologians struggled on, continuing to defend truth, but have been woefully lacking in exegesis. Put succinctly, the problem has been that systematic theologians do not give sufficient attention to the shape of the text, do not perceive the communicative and literary modes in the text, and employ a framework of reasoning which throttles the direction and focus of the text. Compartmentalizing study of the Bible into Old and New Testaments Historical and systematic theology does not always help. It frequently aids in predetermining what questions we can ask of the text and hence the answers we receive. This amounts to a low view of scripture no matter how loudly we proclaim inerrancy. As a young pastor serving in the boondocks in hinterlands of Ontario in Canada, I heard that Carl F. H. Henry would be giving a lecture in Montreal, six hours drive from my town. The following statement made a deep impression on me. He said, activism today so hurries evangelical worship, prayer and Bible reading, theological study and reflection that we risk becoming practical atheists steeped in this worldly priorities. Theological renewal is a farce apart from time for God and his word. 
Is it too much to ask Christians in favored North America in their struggle to be evangelically authentic, to do their theological homework once again, to feast on mighty truths that can rebuff the blows of an ungodly age, to learn biblical lessons before the sword and the dungeons overtake them. Wow. I still remember hearing some of that exposition presented to us in a course on Isaiah that I took with him at Southern Seminary, and that was totally life-changing. So, God is totally devoted and committed to his people. He has this unwavering commitment to his people, but it also involves a total devotion to his name. And this shouldn't be surprising to us because Jesus implied in Matthew twenty-two forty that loving God and loving one's neighbor are inextricably intertwined. So, we shouldn't be surprised that social justice, loving one's neighbor, and total devotion to God's name, loving God, go hand in hand. So, in Ezekiel, what does God say? He says, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. Ezekiel 36, 22. So by bringing upon themselves the judgment of Yahweh, they ended up as exiles, which made the nation suspect that their God was not holy, that is, not completely devoted to them. In other words, uh, Ezekiel 36, 20 says, but when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. In that people said of them, these are the people of Yahweh, and yet they had to go out of his land. Thus, to profane God's holy name is to cause pagans to doubt God's devotion and faithfulness and commitment to his people. Notice that Ezekiel doesn't imply that God's purity or his transcendence or his exalted separateness are at stake here. No, it's his devotion to his people. So in the next verse, God says that his own people have been guilty of profaning his holy name and he will vindicate his holiness by doing a list of things, some of which include gathering them and bringing them to their own land, verse 24, cleansing them specifically of their idolatry, verse 25, giving them a new heart, Verse 26, putting his spirit within them and causing them to walk in his statutes. So, one of the motivations of the new covenant, one of the motivations underlying the new covenant is the vindication of God's holiness. And one of the central ways he accomplishes this is by giving his spirit, his holy spirit. So I hope you see this. Ezekiel is giving us a special key here to understand how the Holy Spirit and the New Covenant are inextricably intertwined. And the reason the New Covenant had to happen was to show God's holiness. And who is the life-giving force behind the New Covenant? The Holy Spirit. Now, one of the first mentions of the Holy Spirit's role and purpose appears in John 14, 26. Okay, so we're trying to get to the bottom of this. Why is he the Holy Spirit, not the loving spirit or the great spirit, even though he is those things? But why is this chosen for his title so central to his character? So John 14, 26, when Jesus says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So what does he do? His role and his purpose is to help and to teach his people and to bring to their memories Jesus' words. Now, good and helpful teachers are usually marked by their devotion to their students, not by their separateness or lofty transcendence above their students. I mean, does that make sense? It's pretty simple, but what I, what I want to do more than anything with this series is at least help us move away from this false etymology 
that led us to think that holiness has to do with separateness. Even if you're not completely sold on what I think it does mean in the context of Scripture, I want you to at least be sold on the fact that it doesn't mean separate, okay? Now, along these same lines, let's keep keep going here. We see in Acts 9.31 that the Holy Spirit comforts and encourages. Acts 9.31 says, Walking in the comfort or encouragement of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. So once again, the idea of comfort or encouragement does not fit reasonably with the traditional definition of holy. If this is so central to who he is, why then would he be called holy if it had nothing to do with his central purpose and role and actions? So if we keep looking at what the Spirit does to manifest his devotion to his people, we see things like Romans 8, 26 and 27. What does he do? He intercedes for us, right? Romans 15, 13, what does he do? He empowers us to abound in hope. Romans 8, 11, what does he do? The Spirit gives us life. Romans 15, 19, what does he do? He brings unbelievers to obedience to demonstrate his total devotion to his people in the new covenant. What else? 1 Corinthians 2.10. He reveals deep and glorious things to us. What does 1 Corinthians 6.11 reveal? Washing, sanctifying, and justifying us is what he does. And then Galatians 5.22 and 23, what does he do? He bears all kinds of beautiful fruit in our lives. And then Ephesians 4.20, he seals our security for the day of redemption. 2 Timothy 1.14, he dwells in us. And then Titus 3.5, he renews us. So all of these beautiful characteristics, if we consider them, it would be illogical to conclude that the most fundamental and essential nature of the Spirit is moral cleanness and purity, right? Yet this is what, you know, at the beginning I was talking about has has become the standard all over the world because of the missionary movement, has become the standard in many, many, many languages to refer to the Spirit as the clean Spirit, or the pure spirit, as a translation of Holy Spirit. And what's so ironic about this is that in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, in the list of the fruits of the spirit, purity doesn't even appear there. Of course, I'm not implying that the spirit isn't pure, and I'm not implying that the Holy Spirit doesn't birth purity in us. Of course he does. But that is not what his name means. So if we look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, what do these point to? They point to a God who is dedicated to restoring us as a people who show the world what he is like and who treat each other in holy ways as he treats us. So this involves many things, not not least of which is to give the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Right? This brings us back to Isaiah 5, the whole issue of social justice. Only the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, can make us into a holy nation that reflects him and proclaims the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. So a holy nation is a people totally devoted to God in the unflaggingly faithful way God has been devoted to his people from the beginning. And I'm just going to say here that, unfortunately, much of the charismatic movement has taken certain works of the Holy Spirit and placed them in a spotlight, practically concealing the beautiful elements of his nature and role that we just talked about. And there are also a lot of these works of the Holy Spirit that they talk about that are nefarious. Some of them are legitimate, but many of them are not. So in many places and many circles, the name 
Holy Spirit has come to carry connotations of wild ecstasies, loss of control rather than self-control, Galatians 5.23, falling over, loudness, dancing, raising of hands, yelling, meaningless babble, majestic sounding worship bands, creepy laughter, dreams and visions and prediction of the future. Now, I'll let you decide which of these things are biblical or not. But much of what is placed in the spotlight focuses on the external, flamboyant, or even theatrical, which serves to further obscure what it means, what it means that the Holy Spirit is holy. In many of these circles, there is a conspicuous absence of careful investigation into what the entire Bible teaches about the holiness of God and the implications of being spirit-filled people who walk by the Spirit. It's often simply assumed, and, and this is not just in those, those circles, but in other circles, it's simply assumed that people know what it means when the Spirit is called holy. Yet ironically, it may be that many who build their entire congregations and services around supposed encounters with the Holy Spirit don't actually know what this means. The great need of every hour, like Dr. Gentry said, is a conscientious return to Scripture as authority over experience, combined with a longing to know the Holy Spirit as a person rather than as an impersonal force. And I think the beautiful thing about understanding holy in a biblical way brings back the personal nature. Total devotion and intimacy that results of that is so much more personable than an abstraction like transcendence or the common notion of purity or separation. It's just more personable. When Christians begin to treat him as a real person, they will be be able to take his name seriously as something with clear meaning and not merely the nebulous title of some thing that makes people more extroverted, for example. And in turn, this will empower believers with purpose as they endeavor to reflect the holy character of God as the Holy Spirit enables them to do so. Well, let's end there. There will need to be another episode to finish this series. But thank you for listening. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us understand the Bible better, go deeper into it, and ultimately become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.